Hello and welcome to the Canadian Grapevine Certification Network or CGCN's second webinar in a four-part webinar series on grapevine viruses. My name is Bill Armstrong and I sit on CGCN's Knowledge, Technology and Transfer or KTT's board along with Ross Wise and Darian Tampriel. To give you a little background on myself, I live in the western end of Annapolis Valley of Nova Scotia near Annapolis Royal. And in our vineyard, we grow mostly uh, vinifera's like Chardonnay, Riesling, Sauvignon Blanc, and the hybrid Vidal Blanc. The first webinar in this series of four webinars was hosted by Ross Wise and Darian Tempriel. This webinar was on red, red blotch, and you'll find that webinar on CGCN's website, www.cgcn-rccv.ca. Today's webinar is on grapevine leaf roll, and we have with us today three very distinguished guests. They are Dr. Jose Ramon Herbez Torres, Dr. Tom Lowry, and Dr. Vaughn Bell. Before I pass this webinar over to Darian, who will be your host and moderator, I would like to mention a few guidelines. Please keep yourself muted throughout this webinar. There will be a Q&A session at the end of this webinar after everyone has presented their material. Please use a chat feature at the bottom of your screen to ask your questions and also please identify who your question is addressed to, either Jose, Tom, or Vaughn. Then Darian, our moderator, will direct your questions accordingly. This webinar will be posted on CGCN's website shortly. Thank you very much for attending CGCN's webinar. And here is Darian, who will give you a brief presentation. Darian? Yes, thank you, Bill. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen here. Okay, you should be able to see my screen now. Just make sure we go to the next slide. There we go. And all right. All right, so thank you so much and welcome to CGCN's second webinar. Uh, if you were in our first webinar on Red Blotch, I presented CGCN, uh, the company as a whole, uh, and today I'm going to go into a bit more detail about uh, our certification programs. So I'll jump right into it. Start things off, I'll briefly describe our long-term virus strategy. So CGCN would like to see a long-term virus strategy implemented in Canada by 2025 in order to reduce and if possible, eliminate virus infections in vineyards across Canada, the following conditions must be met. First, as propagating material is the initial main source of viral pathogens, enough certified virus-free grapevines of commercially acceptable varieties must be available to meet the routine replanting and expansion needs. As much as possible, these grapevines should be sourced from domestic production. Provincial legislation requiring that only certified virus-free material from accepted sources would be allowed for replanting or establishing new vineyards could greatly contribute to the success of a virus mitigation strategy. Second, well-timed aggressive vector control that must be implemented by all growers in an area will need to be implemented. Cleaning protocols for equipment that is moved between vineyards needs to be implemented rigorously. Currently, the known vectors of grapevine leaf roll associated virus one and three can be effectively controlled in both conventional and organic vineyards. Participation in vector programs will need to be mandatory to achieve substantial reduction in spread of, uh, in substantial reduction in spread of viruses. Third, once sufficient certified propagating material of desired varieties and clones is available, there will be a need for targeted coordinated area-wide roguing or whole block pullout and replacement. Once all infected vines have been removed from a participating province, it may be possible to relist the leaf roll complex viruses, fan leaf virus, red blotch virus, arabis mosaic viruses, and other quarantinable pests for that province, which would reduce the chance of reintroduction through imports. Provinces could also require that all grapevines planted must be from accepted certified sources. So CGCN has two clean plant protocols that will run in parallel for the time being. If you were here for our first webinar, some of this information may sound familiar, but I'll go into a bit more detail with our new program. So the interim verification program works with nurseries to test existing propagation blocks for leaf roll one, three, red blotch, and pinot gris virus at a 50-50 cost share with a grant administered by AAFC. Collection of vines and testing is being done by a third party from CGCN at the Covey Virus Testing Lab at Brock University. We are working with both nurseries for general propagation as well as wineries and growers 
who wish to do custom propagation for their own vineyards for this program. Uh, I will go into detail about custom propagation in a couple slides. So our interim verification program tests uh, existing nursery propagation blocks. The first phase of testing will involve a random sample of 10% of the vineyard, including visual inspection and PCR testing. If 15% or more of the vineyard is infected, it's dropped from the program. If less than 15% is infected, it's moved to the second phase of testing. The second phase of protocols involves testing each individual vine via a composite sample of leaves from either five vines or canes from two samples. The, or two vines, sorry. The threshold of virus is 0.1% or one in 1,000 vines. If the composite sample is found to be more than 0.1% infected, the nursery has the option to test each vine individually and remove only those infected vines or remove the entire sample. Once the vineyard is, is tested and confirmed clean under the 0.1% threshold, the plants propagated from those vines are verified by CGCN. Although like all other certification programs, no warranty is given on the final plant. Yearly audits through a 10% random sample, as well as visual inspection of the vineyards and nursery records will occur to ensure that there has been no reinfection of the propagation block. So look for this badge at your favorite Canadian nursery to see if they are participating in our verification program. Current participants are North Shore Grapevine Nursery, Viticulture A&M, and Canadian Fruit Tree Nursery, which is a part of Vineland Growers. All nurseries have their results tested and clean. These will be posted on our website as they are available. CGCN has also opened up the interim protocols to Canadian grape growers and wineries who would be interested in partnering with a nursery for custom propagation of grapevines from their own vineyard. The number one question I get asked is how does this program work? So this is how it works. The nursery and grape grower or winery both have to have a contract with CGCN. There needs to be a proven relationship for propagation between the grape grower or winery and nursery. The grape grower or winery agrees to pay for the testing, collection, mapping and of the propagation block as well as travel. Collection and testing of vines is at a 50-50 cost share with CGCN through an administered grant with AAFC. Testing can be done on leaf or cane samples according to our code of practice and time of year. Samples are tested for the four viruses of concern, so leaf roll one, three, red blotch, and pinot gris. The grape grower or winery will follow the same code of practice as nurseries, including removal of infected vines. CGCM will need to be pro provided an audit trail that the grape vines that were propagated were sold back to the grower or winery, and the nursery will remit a 10 cent levy on each CGCM vine sold. The grape grower or winery would not have to continue testing at the audit level if they choose not to take budwood the following year. If they choose to do so, auditing is required. This program is available to growers and wineries on a first come first serve basis. So if you would like to ask any questions or if you would like to sign up, please email me with the contact information at the end of my presentation. Now we'll jump into our certification program. Since the release of the amended certification standards, CGCN allows certification of grapevine planting under two distinct protocols, option one, which I'll be addressing here, and option two, which is our new certification program I will address in our next slide. So material propagated from our G1 repository under the option one protocol will be deemed and labeled certified plus. We currently have approximately 50 clones, including rootstock stored clean in the CFIA Center for Plant Health in Sydney, BC. These vines have went through testing, so heat therapy or tissue culture, for a whole range of viruses and pathogens. Once all tests come back negative, the varietals are deemed clean and put into the repository. These vines are propagated through four levels, known as Generation 1 to Generation 4, where CGCN is able to trace the phytosanitary status of each vine. G1 is the mother block of clean stock. G1A, G2, and G3 are multiplication blocks to bulk up material, which we are currently accepting applications from interested nurseries to apply to. And then G4 is in the grower's vineyard. We currently have two nurseries participating in this program at the G1A level. That will be Agriforest Biotechnologies, located in Kelowna, BC, and Upper Canada Growers, located in Harrow, Ontario. Now I'll explain our new Option 2 certification program protocols. This was recently just launched two weeks ago. Material propagated under option two protocols will be deemed and labeled certified. CGCN has made the distinction between certified and certified plus material because the certification processes and requirements differ. 
certified material is already existing vineyard blocks that have been tested for over 30 viruses of concern via high throughput sequencing technology currently completed at the Covey Grapevine Virus Diagnostic Lab. All propagative material produced under this program must be derived from existing plantings where in the initial year, all plants to be used for propagating material have been tested for all the viruses of concern. Any plants that test positive for the viruses of concern will have to be removed and replanted with CGC and approved virus-free material if available. Oh, sorry. There we go. Um, uh, any other rootstock sources must be tested before grafting. When existing plantings are found free of all viruses, except for grapevine repesta stem pinning associated virus and grapevine fleck virus, the plants will be considered generation three. And then G4 material is propagated from G3. In subsequent years, a random composite sample of 20% of a certified planting will initially be re required. The frequency and sample size of long-term ongoing retesting will be established based on the types of viruses found in the initial tests and on the presence or absence of confirmed or suspected vectors. Our option two protocols can be found on our website under the certification heading. We also encourage growers or wineries to contact us if they wish to see certain varietals available through the program, as we are consistently monitoring the industry to see what is wanted and to ensure our repository is fulfilling those wants. You can either submit your wish list varietals through our contact page on our website, or you can email me with the contact information at the end of my presentation. And lastly, before I conclude, PGCN would like to acknowledge the funding for this project that has been provided through the Ag Reassurance Program under the Canadian Agricultural Partnership, a federal provincial territorial initiative. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions, please use this contact information uh, for this is to me for any questions you have with our programs. And I'll leave this up while I introduce our first speaker of the day. So Dr. Jose Ramon Urbez Torres is a research scientist at the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada Summerland Research and Development Centre in British Columbia and serves as adjunct professor in the biology department at the University of British Columbia Okanagan campus. He received a postgraduate master's degree in viticulture, enology and wine marketing in 2001 from the International Social Science Council and the degree of agricultural engineering in 2004 from the University of Valladolid in Spain. He completed a PhD in plant pathology in 2009 at the University of California, Davis. Dr. Urbez Torres has studied diseases of woody perennial crops since 1999, and his current research at AAFC focuses on the development and implementation of sustainable management strategies against fungal, bacterial, and viral diseases of grapevines and tree fruits in Canada. So I'll stop sharing my presentation here, and I pass it off to Jose. Thank you very much, uh, Darian. Let's see if you can see that. Can everybody see the presentation? Yes. All good? Okay. Thank you very much, Darian, for the introduction and thank you very much for the invitation to speak today in this webinar. So today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, the current status of grapevine liberal disease in Canada and the impacts that the disease have on plant health and fruit quality. So brief summary, as I mentioned before, I will give a very brief introduction about liberal disease. We will jump into the current situation across the country on, on liberal, liberal uh, disease viruses. And I finalize uh, the presentation talking about the impacts that these diseases have on um, uh, fruit quality and, as well as uh, plant health and wine. So, grapevine liver disease eh, is a complex disease caused by different uh, viruses, uh, different plant viruses, all in the family cluster of Viridae. And these viruses have been named, you know. Um, uh, sequentially, uh, as they were uh, discovered, we have grapevine liberal assisted virus one, two, three, four, with different genetically divergent strains, and grapevine liberal associated virus seven. As you can see, not all the viruses are, uh, they are taxonomically different and belong to different genus. Yeah? Uh, liberal one, three, and uh, four belongs to the genus Amperovirus. 
leaf rod 2, cluster virus, and leaf rod 7 belongs to the genus Dela <coughs> rivirus. I highlighted in bold here, driven leaf rod the virus 3, because this is the, the virus of most concern and is known uh, worldwide to be responsible for the, the most impact on, uh, on plants. Liberal disease is present wherever grapes are grown. So it uh, has a worldwide distribution uh, and in, in most grape growing regions in the world. So in terms of the symptoms, uh, liberal disease is uh, very characteristic symptoms in red cultivars, as you can see here. And usually the, the vines start turning red uh, at the middle of the growing season towards the end of the season. The basal leaves eh, closer to the, to the cordon are the first ones to start turning red. And as time uh, goes, you know, all the canopy uh, of the vines will have this characteristic reddish color. Of course, as the disease indicates, leaf roll, the blade of the, of the leaves start rolling. And it's characteristic to see that the veins stay green. In white cultivars, of course, we are not going to see this red pigmentation in the leaves. But as you can observe, this is a picture of Chardonnay. Uh, the, we can also see the rolling of the leaves and chlorosis. Uh, usually this chlorosis is observed when there is a very high impact or infection in the, in, in the vines. Uh, I had to mention that these are textbook pictures, but symptoms can vary depending on the cultivar uh, that we, we are having in both either red or white cultivars. And important to Canada, uh, uh, we have also uh, we, we grow hybrid cultivars. And in these hybrid cultivars, in many of them, uh, uh, symptoms of viral are not expressed. So we can have hybrid cultivars infected, but not so in symptoms. In terms of the spread, uh, we have, of course, you know, the primary spread of these viruses is with contaminated material coming uh, from, uh, from nurseries or propagation sources. Uh, that we can have either the scion or the rootstock, you know, contaminated when it's planted into the uh, vineyard. Of course, this will uh, continue this infected plant, or you know, the, the virus infected mother vine propagation uh, again into the vineyard. Once the vines are infected in the vineyard, we have a secondary spread that is uh, conducted by insect vectors. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this because Tom Lore is going to talk about that, but. Mainly, you know, millibugs and uh, scale insects eh, that are going to be able to uh, spread the, the virus. Primary leaf roll virus three and leaf roll virus one. In terms of the impact of this disease, well, uh, there are different studies, primary conducted in North America in, in the United States, and we can see that uh, the economic impact. Uh, is quite significant, you know, in the state of New York can go between 25,000 to 40,000 US dollars per hectare in lost revenue. In California, this study was done actually in vineyards in the Napa Valley can go, you know, between $29,000 to almost, you know, a quarter of a million dollars per hectare. And studies in Washington reported about 77% revenue decline. These losses include uh, not only loss in yield, but also in quality and revenue uh, sales uh, from the uh, from the vineyard. Uh, currently, we don't have any economic impact conducted in Canada, but it's expected that uh, the economic losses are, if not similar, maybe higher due to our growing season. We have a much shorter growing season uh, than in many of these uh, growing uh, regions, and we don't have this opportunity to have the fruit maturing for a for a longer time. So I'm gonna move uh, talking about the current status of leaf roll in, in Canada. So first, uh, the first uh, survey in Canada was conducted by CFIA in 1996. And this table represents some of the data that came from that survey in all the provinces, you know, and the survey include Arabic mosaic virus, fan leaf, leaf roll one and leaf roll three. As you can see from this survey, uh, already leaf roll one and leaf roll three was reported from BC. Ontario, only leaf roll three from Quebec, and both leaf roll three and one from Nova Scotia. So these viruses were already present in Canada by 1996. Uh, I have to say in, 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 in a lower percentage, probably mostly here in BC, Quebec, or Nova Scotia, uh, uh, and leaf roll three already in Ontario was present over 10% of the samples collected. So we know that since 1995, or the time that this survey was conducted, the industry has significantly increased in Canada. 
uh, with more uh, uh, plants being in the ground, currently over 31,000 acres across the country. So field surveys have been conducted since 2014 and 16 in BC, 2016 and 18 in a different project in Nova Scotia, and since 2018, currently conducting with the current CAP project in, in Ontario to really evaluate the, the situation of the disease uh, these days. So just to give you an, a snapshot of the different uh, provinces, the survey conducted in British Columbia eh, include 210 blocks, and eh, almost 60% of these blocks, 122, were infected with leaf roll. When I said infected with leaf roll, it can be with any of the leaf roll we have, either one, two, three, eh, or four. Eh, and about 88 blocks, 40%, where, eh, where leaf roll was not present. <laughs> Uh, in Ontario, in this case, very similar percentage, lower number of blocks, but still over 55% of these blocks. In this case, was only tested for leaf roll three. Uh, so 55% of the blocks in Ontario had leaf roll three uh, versus 44% that didn't uh, found leaf roll three. And in Nova Scotia, we have uh, about 60% uh, of the blocks tested uh, with leaf roll uh, infected. So a much higher number here in, in Nova Scotia. I have to say here that uh, in Nova Scotia, for example, a large number of these blocks were hybrid cultivars, eh, where 35 blocks eh, that they were a hybrid versus 18 blocks that they were vinifera, and a very high number of these hybrid cultivars were uh, infected. Similarly, in all three uh, uh, provinces, uh, we have a significant number of young black blocks uh, tested. The, these were blocks that they were tested one, two, or three years after planting. And in many of these blocks, we were able to find the disease, meaning that is clearly shown that there was an introduction, you know, as primary spread with contaminated material. If we move in terms of the samples collected in BC, with more than 3,000 samples collected, we have about more than 30% of these samples have a uh, liberal. Okay? And we can see here that the majority of these samples, of course, have leaf roll three. From this 30%, almost half of them have leaf roll three. And in much lower percentage, we have leaf roll four, leaf roll one, leaf roll two, or any mixed infection of any of these leaf roll. In Ontario, about over 20% of these samples have leaf roll three. As I mentioned before, in Ontario, we're tested only for leaf roll three. And in Nova Scotia, eh, from these 27% of samples, that they were testing positive. We have, again, the vast majority were leaf roll three, over 20%. Uh, and we found leaf roll one in a very small percentage and a mix. So far in Nova Scotia, we haven't found any other uh, leaf roll. They were tested for leaf roll two or leaf roll four, but we were not able to find these uh, leaf rolls in, in Nova Scotia. So also it's important to indicate that not only the distribution is different, you know, sometimes uh, across the provinces, but even within the uh, regional area, like in this case, the Okanagan Valley, here we have the Okanagan Valley from north to south, uh, the distribution can be significantly different. Our work here in, the, in BC showed that the north part of the Okanagan was relatively, you know, um, less infected than the center of the south of Okanagan. As you can see here in the number of block tested and, and the percentage of blocks that they were uh, positive. So we can see here in the south of Canada, where of course most of the acres are planted in, in, in BC, uh, almost 70% of those blocks were infected. Similarly, you know, the distribution of the virus uh, with uh, a still liberal three virus is the dominant viruses in all these three regions in the Okanagan. But again, the south part of the Okanagan with more than half of the samples testing positive, with the vast majority with leaf roll three. So in summary, if we compare the results of the survey from 1996 with, with you know, the current data we have in 2020, there is no doubt about the significant increase of the disease eh, and the prevalence of these viruses. Mostly we can see here with leaf roll three. You know? We went from 2% to more than 15% in British Columbia, eh, doubling the amount of samples collected. We have in Ontario, again, eh, went up to 37%, and in Nova Scotia also a significantly jump, you know, from the incidence of liberal three from the previous survey to the current status. Uh, currently, I have to say, there hasn't been a, um, 
a, field, a large scale field survey conducted in, in, in Quebec. Uh, what we have is a recent paper published by Dr. Fall at AFC in Quebec that they have confirmed you know, the presence of LIRO2 and LIRO3 conducting next generation sequencing studies. But uh, there is, there is a still a lack of a, of a large field survey to know really the status of these viruses in, in Quebec. So I'm going to jump to the last part of my talk in regarding the impacts on plant health and food quality. So this is a work conducted within our project by Dr. Bowen, Carl Bogdanov, and uh, Dr. Asser. Uh, here in Samarang, we were looking into the effects of new role in fruit production, growth, leaf function, the fruit quality, wine quality, and vine cold hardening. So we were trying to tackle most of the parameters that uh, define plant health as well as fruit one quality. So very briefly, the methodology. So uh, we have different blocks and different trials, but I'm going to focus the results because of, of, of time on a Cabernet Franc block that it was a study from 2013, 2016. So in this block, uh, we have each infected vine was paired to with two healthy vines. And we can see here that Every year of the study from 2013 to 2016, the growing degree is quite similar among the years, similar to the harvest time. And in 14, 15, and 16, we made wines out of this uh, trial. So it's a replicated trial with 20 times. You know, in each block, we have 20 infected vines versus 40 healthy vines. All vines were confirmed every year, positive or uh, negative of liberal by uh, PCR. And the data collected every year, you can see here. And I will go in detail with, with that. So first, in terms of gel and components, we can see that we, we only saw significantly difference in reduction in berry clusters in 2016 or you know, an increase in berry mass in 2014. But as you can see in this graph, we didn't have effect on the gel of the vine, of the clusters per vine, and berry cluster and berry mass. So those are basically uh, we didn't observe during all these four years uh, effects of the disease in these parameters. Regarding, <clears throat> oh, sorry, I have this here. Regarding the, the use basic composition, very clearly we observe that the liberal disease decreased, you know, the soluble solids, uh, bricks. In every single year, we can see a significant reduction in soluble solids. An average of 1.2 bricks eh, with up to two bricks maximum we observed in some years. The TA, tetable acidity, we observed an increase in 2015 and 16. Eh? And pH, we observed a decrease in 2016. So again, soluble solids was constantly decreased every single uh, harvest, every single season, while TA and pH were uh, yearly dependent. Uh, regarding the skin composition, eh, again, depending the year, we saw tartaric acid esters decreasing, you know, in 2014. We saw flavonols also decreasing in 2014 and condensed tannins increasing in 2016. Uh, the only parameter that we saw almost constantly uh, significantly different decreasing was the anthocyanins uh, in 2013, 14, and 16, uh, <clears throat> uh, about 7% decrease in, in a skin anthocyanins. So it was having an effect in infected vines. Regarding the berry phenolics, again, we saw a significant reduction, about 11% reduction in anthocyanins from every single year we conducted the study. No significant reduction in skin tannins. We saw a reduction on seed tannin, mostly in 2014, you know, eh? when we got up to 36% reduction in seed tannin. And again, in total tannins, we saw reduction in 2013 and 2014, but not for the other years. We made wines from this uh, trial, from this uh, infected and, and healthy, and this is the methodology uh, of the wines we conducted in 2014, 15, and 16 with all the uh, characteristics. And I'm gonna go uh, briefly to report the results that we got, you know, we have here the PC results. And in 2014, it was the year that we saw uh, most significantly differences. Then we saw reduction in the black fruit flavor an increase in the vegetative flavor. And you can see here, you know, all in red, all the wines made out of infected fruit. We saw a decrease in body and as well a decrease in the length of aftertaste. So 
Leave Roll had an impact, you know, in 2014 in the wines made. In 2015, contrary, we only saw a significantly different reduction in the red fruit aroma, but we didn't see any significant difference, you know, in the rest of the parameters um, evaluated. In 2016, uh, similarly, we can see that no significant difference were observed for any parameters. Just to give you an idea, in 2015, versus 2014, for example, a significant difference regarding the amount of bricks of this uh, must uh, elaborated, a much higher con uh, content of alcohol. And for us, 2015 was the uh, year record in heat uh, where uh, actually growers have uh, difficulties to, uh, uh, to, to reduce the alcohol in, in those wines. You know? We have you know, uh, bricks up to 27 or, or 28 from, from those grapes. Finally, regarding bad hardiness, and this is work that Carl Bogdano has been conducting in our trials. We measured the LT50s, the lethal temperatures that cause 50% bad mortality. And as you can see here in all four growing seasons uh, in, the, in the winter, we didn't see really a significant difference, only a slightly decrease, you know, at the beginning of the season, November 3rd, 2014, or October 31st, 2016. But as we can see later on the, on, on the season, and we didn't observe any significant difference on bad hardiness. So as summary, uh, liberal disease is widespread throughout grapevine growing regions in Canada. It has a significant increase on disease incidence. We have demonstrated primary spread in all regions and secondary spread in BC and Ontario. Liberal three is the most prevalent across Canada. Significant effects on photosynthesis associated with visible symptoms. We didn't see effects on yield and components. Liberal has a consistent reduction in berry bricks, up to two bricks uh, in the trials conducted in BC. Consistent reduction in berry and, one, and wine anthocyanins color, uh, probably due to the delay or retarded in ripening. And the wines were, uh, uh, even though they were year dependent, the results we obtained, wines have uh, inferior sensory quality with a vegetal, vegetal uh, lacking body, color, and fruit flavor and, and aroma. Again, reflect, reflecting a lack of berry maturation, and we didn't see effects on bad hardiness. So finally, of course, acknowledging everybody who was part of this uh, project from the different uh, AFC uh, centers, as well as uh, Dr. Pujari, uh, currently at Kavi, and Wendy McFadden in, in Amafra, and all the students and technicians that have been working in the project, and of course, our funding agencies. So with this, I finish my presentation. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you very much, Jose. Uh, I just wanna remind everyone, if you have any questions to please put them in the question and answer box at the bottom of the screen. I'll be moderating them at the very end of the session after everyone is presented. All right, so for our second presenter of the day. Graduate of the University of Guelph with a Bachelor of Science and a, and a Master's of Science and a PhD from UBC, Dr. Tom Lowry has nearly 25 years of research experience at the Summerland Research and Development Center, AAFC, on sustainable grape pest management, including chemical and biological controls, leaf proper antifeedants, and the use of beneficial vineyard ground cover vegetation. He has also conducted research on the epidemiology and management of insect-borne plant pathogens, including work with grapevine viruses and their vectors since 2011. Affiliate with Covey and an associate professor with UBC Okanagan, Kelowna, he has served for many years on a number of BC Wine Grape Council research and development committees and produced the insect and mite chapter of the BC production guide for grapes and accompanying photo guide for grapevine pests and for beneficial insects. I now welcome Dr. Tom Lowry to present. Thank you very much. Can you hear me clearly with the headset on? Yes, we can. Great. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen here. Once it comes up. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to Sorry, thank you. Tom, we can't see your screen right now. Oh, OK. I don't know what's going on here.
If you'd like, I can bring up your presentation on my computer. I've lost the connection to where did it go? I somehow have been kicked out of here. Uh, can you can you hear me still though? Can everyone see his screen? It should be blank at the moment. We can hear him, but not no. We cannot see. Okay, screen. that's what okay. that's what I was thinking. I've lost the share screen. Um, the feature. Yeah, where? Why have I lost my connection here? <laughs> I'm not sure. Why don't we do this? I will uh, share my screen with your presentation, and then you okay. can just give me a little nudge when we need to to switch the screen. Sounds good. I don't know how I lost you. Uh, let's see. We're going to share the screen, and let me just present it. And... I'm sorry about this. I don't know there what uh, what happened here. That's okay. I think we'll do it this way. There you go. Okay. Now I can't see that. It's not. Uh, can I go back in here quickly? You can carry on with Vaughn and I can figure out why I've not, why I've lost my. Um... Okay, hang on, hang on. Can you can you see it now? Yes, we can, Tom. Okay, good. Found you. So uh, sorry about that. Hopefully, everything will go smoothly now. Um, so uh, thank you for the introduction, Jose. I'm going to carry on uh, talking about the vectors of uh, uh, grapevine leaf roll associated virus. I'll probably just call it leaf roll throughout. Um, so some of the, the key players here, uh, you've uh, already met Jose Urbez Torres. Uh, he's the co-lead on the current project, the CGCN uh, grapevine virus project. My technician, Andrea Bronner, is doing great work with uh, the parasitoids of uh, scale and uh, mealybug right now. Dieter Call is doing some great work, just finishing up his master's with, uh, with me through UBC Okanagan. And uh, Sudarsana Pujari, that uh, many of you know, uh, did a postdoc out with us in Summerland. We are very pleased to have him. So, um, what, I, what we're looking at, I want to give you a little bit more background into the area I'm going to focus on. Jose's covered some of it, but uh, if we go back and look at how this problem occurred in uh, the 1996 National Grapevine Virus Survey that Jose pointed out, uh, there was, uh, they stopped regulating uh, leaf roll viruses after that, simply because there were two, the incidence was too high across Canada. So when that was deregulated, we started to see increases in uh, leaf roll virus infected nursery stock, mainly from Fran arriving from France. Uh, this was also unfortunately followed by high numbers of uh, vectors. So we had explosions of vectors uh, at, that are related to the secondary spread of the virus. <clears throat> Some of this was clearly associated with changes in the uh, use of pesticides, the, the particular pesticides being used. So uh, putting all this together, the increased virus in nursery stock, your primary infection, increased numbers of vectors that are responsible for secondary spread, and we saw a dramatic rise in the incidence of leaf rolls uh, viruses in Canada over the last approximately 15 years. So uh, Jose pointed this out, uh, the picture down on the bottom left, a lot of the white varieties do not show symptoms. It, uh, it really depends on a combination of things, the cultivar, the strain of the virus, et cetera. But a lot of them don't, they're asymptomatic. But once they, the vectors carry it to uh, the, uh, the cultivars that display symptoms, that was also responsible for us starting to see this big outbreak. So that's the situation. And here's a record of the sort of thing we were seeing. And I wanna point out this study plot 
It was a large plot. If you look from 2014, 17.4% infection rate. By the 2017, it had bumped up to 32.2, nearly doubling over that short span. And I have to point out that this location, this study plot, the incidence of vectors was very low. So you could see the kind of explosive nature of the, the problem. Uh, I want to go look, uh, give you a bit of a background on the vector situation. So uh, took this information largely, a very good publication in 2017 on grapevine viruses. And uh, from that, you can see that the first unpublished evidence that great mealybug were the, uh, able to transmit leaf roll virus was uh, 1961, but they never published it. It wasn't until 1988 that we had the first published evidence that mealybugs were transmitting leaf roll virus. 20, by 2017, work had been done showing 11 mealybug and eight soft scale species were, a, were vectors. Uh, as I mentioned, soft scale were ident only identified as vectors in uh, about 1990. So it's really a fairly recent uh, work that's been done on this. And there's still a lot more to, to, to do. If you look here, the picture down below, so here's your typical, the bark's been peeled away, cottony uh, vine scale. Uh, these are just getting ready to produce all the massive amounts of eggs. And there's a, a small uh, great mealybug nymph in there as well. So much of the early vector research was conducted in California with mealybugs. And the reason for this, <coughs> excuse me, they had, um, quite a bit of grapevine uh, leaf roll, but they also, unfortunately for them, have a large number of mealybug species. So a lot of vectors. And here's the eight species that are the most important ones. There are actually a few more. The ones uh, in bold are their major pest problems. They're great mealybug, long-tailed mealybug, and vine mealybug, but they do have these other ones. The ones in red are ones, if the great mealybug we have across Canada, the obscure mealybug and the gills mealybug are likely to show up. This one is a temperate South America, areas like Chile, and it's suited for our environment. So it's possible it'll make it up here. Uh, gills mealybug, it's a North American native that uh, it did arrive in Oregon in 2014. So. Uh, that's very likely to make its way up into Canada as well. But at the moment, we only have the one. So if we look at the ampelloviruses, uh, leaf roll uh, one, three, and four, if we characterize those, there's about 12 to 13 species in that genus. Uh, the leaf roll three is the type species. They're re primarily restricted to the phloem and they're transmitted in a semi-persistent, uh, non-circulative uh, manner. It requires about one hour uh, feeding. That's the acquisition access period for feeding. And then it takes about also an hour to inoculate the plants with the inoculation access period feeding. So uh, restricted host ranges. So these viruses typically don't uh, move into a, a wide range of plants. They're restricted to, in, in this case, uh, pretty much uh, for grapes. Vectors are also restricted to the lower insect taxonomic grouping. So the vectors of these ampelloviruses typically are in a family level or maybe super family. So on the vector side of things, they match up really well that we look at things in the cocoidea uh, mealybug and scale, they feed primarily from the phloem tissue. They have mobile stages like the crawler stage, but they do when they settle, they're not like aphids that fly in and test and fly away. They, they move around, but they have prolonged feeding to test the phloem. It takes longer to get into the phloem. And they have variable host ranges as well. A lot of them are quite restricted to grapevines. So if you put these two together, it's likely that all mealybug and soft scale species are able to transmit leaf roll virus at various efficiencies. So which ones do we have in Canada? 
So first of all, we've done a, quite a bit of work on this, uh, starting with uh, back when, when Sud was here with us. Uh, identification by appearance is not always reliable. For example, the cottony uh, maple scale looks very similar to the cottony vine scale. And uh, even the, the brown scale uh, can be confused. The, uh, what we resorted to was the genetic barcoding used to verify species. So we had uh, taxonomists work with us, but then uh, relied on genetic barcoding. We only acquired the barcode for cottony vine scale uh, quite recently. So it was only uh, Dieter was able to get one out of China that helped solve that. So it is difficult telling them apart, but uh, for Canada, we have it pretty much sorted to these three species. Uh, great mealybug, European fruit lacanium scale shown here on the left, and the cottony vine scale here on the right, and um, as well as the great mealybug. So we have found small numbers of other soft scale species on grapes, including the brown scale. And they're likely, they're all vectors. Uh, there hasn't been enough work to know how efficient the different ones are. So when we look at the biologies of mealybug and soft scale in Canada, the key for this, uh, why they're such a problem, their direct feeding is not a problem. They, they can have huge numbers and they really don't damage the grapes that much, but it's the virus vectoring. And the, for the vectoring, the females produce hundreds of eggs. So they're very uh, fecund. Uh, lots of these mobile crawlers are produced and they disperse. So uh, the mealybugs winter as eggs or crawlers in the cottony masses that they produce under the bark. Uh, there's two generations per year. Uh, soft scale winter is partly grown diapausing females under bark or for the cottony vine scale, we often get uh, lots of them on the lower about two, two foot uh, bottom of the last year's previous year's growth. They'll settle on that. Uh, predators and parasites, and I show the uh, uh, stethorus down here, it's related to the uh, mealybug destroyer. There are lots of predators and parasites that I'll get into, uh, parasitoids in, in a minute, that are very effective uh, control agents. So which vector is most important in Canada? So in relation to the spread of leaf roll virus, the numerous and active crawler stage is most important. So whether it's mealybug or soft scale, it's these crawlers that are, there's lots of them and they're moving around. Mealybug produce crawlers twice a year. The adult mealybugs are more active throughout the year. They don't settle down as permanently as the scale do. So they keep moving around quite a bit. Uh, we've seen that the rapid spread, big outbreaks of uh, leaf roll three in particular are linked to mealybug outbreaks. So uh, mealybug appears to be most important in Canada. And that's also as uh, Jose indicated where we see a difference between the North and South of the Okanagan. In the north, we have very few mealybug. They're largely absent. We don't see a lot of spread, rapid spread in the north. In the south Okanagan, where we can get huge outbreaks of mealybug, uh, that's where we see the big outbreak. So mealybug seems to be our biggest problem. But in some areas, as I mentioned in the north, we only have uh, soft scale, the, the cottony vine scale. But we can get huge numbers. So if you look at this picture down the bottom right, this isn't in the lab. This is a, a picture uh, leaf from the field. And you can see the petiole is just crammed with cottony vine scale nymphs. And there was just a huge population. So in this case, uh, often scale are major contributors to the spread of the virus as well. So we're worried about both uh, mealybug and scale, and we need to manage them. As uh, Jose pointed out, uh, management of uh, leaf roll virus of the vectors for secondary spread is really important. So we have four control options or considerations. Uh, late dormant oils, foliar contact insecticides typically aimed against the crawlers, and these are contact ones like uh, malathion systemic insecticides against the nymphs that are settled on the leaves, 
And we want to maintain predators and parasitoids that can often provide effective control. Here's just a picture of, I mentioned they don't cause a lot of direct damage, but they can with this, particularly table grapes, when you get huge infestations, there can be some direct damage there. Dormant oil, uh, late dormant oil sprays do help. Uh, they can be very effective. This uh, uh, turbo, this recapture sprayer, it's actually too fine a mist. You could get better control with high spray volume directed to the cordon and trunk and uh, make sure you get good coverage because they're down under the bark here. So here's some uh, uh, European fruit lecanium scale down under the bark. So the oil spray is better when there's not a lot of bark. So as vines get older, uh, it's a little more difficult, but uh, you can get quite good control. For the timing for the crawlers, these things like malathion sprays, one of the tricks you can use is uh, uh, sticky tape with the sticky side out, uh, turned out. And this is just a quick uh, uh, preliminary slide from quite a while ago, but showing, uh, use the tape, you can, capture the crawlers, you know when they're coming out. Uh, and also looked at leaves, here's when they move from the uh, crawling from the overwintering sites onto the leaves. So you want to time your spray for this area when the crawlers are active. But it's quite a bit of work, it's tedious looking at these uh, bits of tape. So here's a picture of a crawler captured on tape. The problem with this, with any timing, when you look across different plots, different vineyards, you put them all together, you see numerous peaks at individual vineyards, but also different timing, different peaks at the different sites. So for crawlers, timing those sprays, it comes down almost to uh, individual sites that would have to be monitored. So it's pretty tricky. This arrow back here, is an uh, indication of a very small bump when the second generation mealybugs were recorded. So it's possible, but uh, more people, more growers are using systemic foliar insecticide applications against the nymphs that are on the leaves. Gives you a little more latitude with the timing. Uh, you do, I need to caution when using neonicotinoids to avoid resurgence that we have seen outbreaks where they, they bump back over time if they're not kept under control. Uh, horticultural oil sprays in the summer have been shown to be quite effective. And what we need to do, we really need to work on additional new materials, uh, particularly looking at their, their effect on uh, parasites and uh, parasitism rates. Here's just an example, some preliminary work from quite a while ago. If you just go over here to these peaks, here's the control peak with uh, dormant oil. You can take that down more than half. If you combine, you can look at things like malathion targeted against the crawlers. It worked pretty well. And then if you have the uh, Movento, uh, you get further control and combining oil and dormant oil and Movento, you got the best control. And that really is uh, probably your best option is to use a dormant oil and then follow that up with either targeting the crawlers or the uh, nymphs settled on the leaves. Quickly, I'll go through biocontrol. There are fortunately large numbers of predators and parasitoids that help keep mealybug and scale in check. And outbreaks of these pests is mostly related to sprays of insecticides that are harmful to the beneficial insects. So uh, these parasitoids and uh, predators, they exert their controls during all stages of the vector development. So here's a, a overwintered female. You can see all these parasites. This is uh, uh, these little holes here. Several parasites have come out of this one. Here's a, during the summer, a nymph on a leaf, and you can see the emergence hole where another parasitoid has come out of that one. So they can be very effective. Uh, as I mentioned, Andrea has been looking at taking some great pictures, getting all these identified. Nobody knew there hadn't been any work in Canada. We didn't know exactly how much uh, control we were getting or what species. I'm just gonna show you some quickly, some beautiful pictures. We like to see any of these good parasites that are doing a good job keeping things cleaned up. So far, uh, we have six species of parasites of the cottony vine scale. 
uh, and uh, haven't done quite as much work on mealybug, but uh, they're, they're quite effective. Uh, here's a couple more. There's also a species of fly that go into the egg masses and the larvae consume the eggs and the, uh, the, the crawlers, mostly the eggs that are in those uh, cottony masses or of the cottony vine scale. Uh, this one down below here, this parasitoid of mealybug, this was actually moved around as a biocontrol agent because it's quite effective. So to summarize, to manage uh, grapevine leaf roll associated viruses, uh, particularly we're talking about leaf roll three, in addition to clean nursery stock and a reduction in virus source, uh, there is a need for effective management of insect vectors. And when I say virus source, I also mean if you have plant, you know, new plantings, uh, what do you have next to them? If they're surrounded with infected uh, plants, infected vines, even if you have very good vector control, you might still end up with quite a problem. Vector control includes dormant oil sprays and insecticides either targeted against the crawlers or the nymphs, and it needs to be or is best combined with preservation of parasitoids and other natural enemies. Uh, numbers of European fruit lacanium scale, cottony vine scale, and great mealybug, uh, they vary between production regions and years, particularly in response to insecticide use. Uh, additional studies are required to assess, assess and assist in the registration of new insecticides and to evaluate their effects on parasitism rates. Uh, we have problems in Canada uh, getting insecticides re registered. We're always considered a minor crop, and a lot of companies don't want to go to the extra effort and cost to register in Canada. With that, uh, thank you very much. This picture here, this is what we're hoping to avoid with uh, proper vector control contributing to the eradication of leaf roll viruses. And I'd like to thank the, the various uh, organizations, BC Wine Grape Council, uh, CGCN, uh, our lot of help at Summerland, uh, the AFC station there, uh, technicians, students, et cetera, and collaborators on this project and the, all the collaborating wineries and vineyards where we carry out the bulk of our work. And with that, thank you very much. All right, thank you much. Thank you very much, Tom. And we'll move on to our last speaker of the day, which is uh, Vaughn Bell. Uh, I do want to remind everyone, if you have questions, please put them in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen, and they will be answered at the end of the session. So Vaughn Bell is a senior scientist working for the New Zealand Institute for Plant and Food Research. He's based in Havelock North, which is situated in Hawke's Bay on the east coast of the North Island. Since 2004, he has studied sap feeding mealybugs in vineyards with an emphasis on their ecology, biology, and, abil and ability to transmit grapevine leaf roll virus. By examining the interrelationship between the vine, virus, and vector, his findings contributed to the development of a practical and financially sustainable virus management response commonly deployed in commercial vineyards in New Zealand. And with that, I pass it off to Vaughn Bell to close us out today. Thank you. Thank you. Right, can everyone see that okay? Can you hear me? Yes, we can see it and we can hear you perfectly. Lovely, okay. All right, that's it's good. It's, uh, it's a bit daunting doing these uh, webinars from home, um, not being able to see the reactions of the audience. Um, it's always a concern of mine that I'm, uh, I'm on mute and I'm talking to no one but myself and my dog who's here. <laughs> Hello, Canada, uh, nice to, uh, I'll be talking with you again um, about the subject of uh, grapevine leaf roll virus. Uh, it's something which we've worked on a lot here in New Zealand, as, as many of you will know. Um, I'm going to uh, give you an out outline of, of how we've gone towards trying to manage this particularly nasty virus here in New Zealand. And uh, there are a number of colleagues here, too many to list, but there are more than just me behind this program. So um, the, the overview of today's presentation, there are a number of steps that we've taken along, along this uh, 
this program and uh, I'm going to summarize for you probably the last 20 years of what we've done um, in very bullet point form. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, a multi-tactic or, or what we call an integrated response um, to managing this disease. It's very much focused on practical management in the vineyard, what works for the growers rather than purely at an academic level. And I'm going to pose uh, a few ideas uh, for Canada for, for you to consider uh, in the management of this disease. I'm not going to dwell on this too much. I, I hadn't, at the time of writing this presentation, I hadn't seen um, Jose or Tom's presentation, so I wasn't quite sure how much detail to go in. So I'm going to skip through this here. Um, this is the classic foliar symptoms of grapevine leaf roll virus. Uh, this is leaf roll three here in New Zealand. And also to reiterate the point made previously by both Tom and Jose, that in whiteberry cultivars, uh, we, we're dealing with an asymptomatic disease. Um, yes, after a long period of infection, you will start to see the, the margins of the leaves rolling. But in terms of being able to act quickly uh, soon after a vine has become infected, it's, it's almost impossible to do it and, and most of the white cultivars grown here in New Zealand and that's particularly true of Sauvignon Blanc which dominates the wine industry so we have a major obstacle just through the, the cultivars that we're growing here in New Zealand and uh, for many of you growing white berry cultivars or, or with hybrids up there um, and of course the rootstocks themselves they're, they're asymptomatic it's, it's virtually impossible to reliably detect leaf roll virus other than through laboratory techniques. Now, New Zealand's response to grapevine leaf roll three, and I'm gonna use that uh, GLRAV3 code through this presentation. Um, it, it really, I guess it kicked off in the early 2000s or late 1990s really with the development of what we call the, the grafted grapevine standard, which is the equivalent of your CGCN. That is the bedrock upon which everything is developed. So I am delighted to see that CGCN is, is, is gaining traction over there. Uh, things can only get better. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. It is a, a very, it's the fundamental point at which we need to start a, a virus management program here in New Zealand. The awareness of, of leaf roll virus kind of kicked off in around 2005, where the wine industry um, undertook a survey of wineries across the country, trying to gauge an understanding of, of what they were up against, how much knowledge was out there around the virus, virus management around the vectors and vector management. That was followed a year later with a literature review, looking at the virus, virus management practices, what the vectors were, what was happening around the world, what did we know about this disease. We had our own insights here in New Zealand, but there were an awful lot of um, uh, conjecture and ad hoc ideas as to what was going. So we tried to sort of solidify the thinking by looking at what had been happening overseas. And from that, within a couple of years, we managed to secure some, some research funding uh, from, from government and from the New Zealand wine industry. Um, and that led to um, what we called the Virus Elimination Project, which started in 2009. Um, there were a number of parts to that. The part that I was most closely involved in looked at case study vineyards. So we selected a range of vineyards. We looked at them closely over a period of six to seven years. And throughout that period, there was a big emphasis on extension, sharing the knowledge um, the, the new understanding we had of the virus, of the vector, of the patterns of spread, the control tactics that we might be adopting. Um, and of course, in the years since the conclusion of the virus elimination study, there's, there's been a range of other research questions and studies that have, have started to arise. I, I won't be going into those today. So here's the, uh, the grafted grapevine standard. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen this. It's widely available on the web. In New Zealand, we have seven members of what we call the Vine Industry Nursery Association, VINA. Um, they're probably dominated by two or three quite big players. Um, they're spread around the country. And I heard um, um, Darian mentioned the word warranty before, and, and that I'm going to highlight that again. I've used the word an assurance. There is no guarantees 
with the grafted grapevine standard or any equivalent standard around the world that everything you will get will be virus free. But it's just, unless they're going to be testing every single piece of material, it becomes very, very difficult. So in New Zealand, we give an assurance that they are free of leaf roll three. Um, I would add here, <clears throat> we don't have red blotch virus in New Zealand. So we're really just screening for leaf roll three. Um, leaf roll one is, is a bit of an issue, but it's, it's of less economic importance than leaf roll three. And, uh, you know, the goal of, of these standards is obviously to reduce the possibility that you in the vineyard will receive infected, infected vine material. And I reiterate that comment that this is a critical platform from which everything else uh, arises. The virus elimination project in New Zealand, as I say, kicked off in around 2008-9. It was an in-vineyard response. So we were kind of reacting to an industry that wanted to know how to manage, could they manage this disease in the vineyard? So the objective here was to develop and test practical integrated response to leaf roll in an, in an effort to reduce the incidence of the disease, the annual incidence to less than 1%. As I noted, we worked with uh, multiple case study vineyards. Uh, in my case, there were 13 of those. And we posed a number of questions. The first of which was, could we visually detect leaf roll virus reliably in the vineyard? The last thing the growers wanted to do was, um, was to actually have to collect vine material and then send it away to a laboratory to confirm whether what they were looking at was leaf roll virus or, or something else. So understanding the visual symptoms, <clears throat> excuse me, and being able to reliably identify the disease uh, was really important. We wanted to know if, if removing or roguing those individual infected vines that showed those foliar symptoms, could that contain the disease and could we effectively eliminate the disease or reduce it to that incidence of less than 1% as we talked about. We wanted to know how vector abundance influenced virus management outcomes. We, we saw vineyards with very few mealybugs um, and vineyard, vineyards with very high numbers of mealybugs. And on the surface of it, we were seeing qu two quite different uh, outcomes in virus management based on those number of vectors. So I'm going to reiterate a comment that Tom made here. Managing the vectors is a really important part of this process. And of course, we collected data, reported the results and shared the knowledge throughout the virus elimination project. And indeed, um, you know, we continue to do that to varying degrees here in New Zealand. And, and you know, this is an example here today in, in Canada. Visual symptom identification on the left there, we have a Pinot Noir vine, uh, foliar symptoms, classical foliar symptoms of grapevine leaf roll three. And on the right, um, magnesium deficiency. So it was really important um, that the growers have confidence to be able to go out there and look, the, look for the, um, the infection, to see the infection and be confident that what they were going to be tagging was a vine that was infected with leaf roll and not magnesium deficiency. So a lot of the technology transfer and extension that's occurred here in New Zealand has focused on things like visual symptom identification. So looking at um, the different uh, vine, uh, the different leaf patterns that we see uh, in our vineyards. I mean, cane girdling is a classic example. You'll end up with a cane where all the leaves are red and you can other, have other syndromes, something we call Syrah um, decline, which can end up with red leaves, which to the untrained eye might be mistaken for the foliar symptoms for leaf roll virus. So we know that if we can get the training going, visual symptom identification for leaf roll virus is a really reliable way of being able to detect the disease in the vineyard that reduces costs and times time for the grower in his or her vineyard. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then of course we had the, um, the vine removal protocol, the or roguing as we call it here. Uh, in New Zealand, the, agree the agreed threshold beyond which roguing the removal of individual infected vines is deemed to be, um, if you like, uneconomic or, or non-viable is, is an incidence of 20%. Uh, that'll vary a little bit around the world. I, I gather that in California, I think there's, they've got that roguing threshold at around 25%. 
Canada, I think, probably needs to identify where their roguing threshold might be. Beyond that level, uh, the, the, the word here in New Zealand is that consideration needs to be given to uh, managing the spread of the disease, um, particularly to adjoining blocks, and potentially planning for the removal, the eventual whole block removal of um, those blocks that have more than 20% incidence. Roguing is an annual affair in New Zealand. If you are going to be doing this program, you need to be on it every year. And indeed, I'd go so far as to say that in New Zealand now, in many of our vineyards, it's regarded as the new normal. Uh, roguing is just part of the landscape. And then of course, the, uh, the, the, the third part of this integrated response um, over and above, of course, the, um, the high health uh, vine program, is, is managing the insects, the, the vectors. Here's the long-tailed mealybug. We have two mealybug species that are problematic in our vineyards in New Zealand. This one, the long-tailed mealybug, and a second one called the citrophilus mealybug. Scale insects really aren't too much of a problem for us. They're more of an incidental uh, insect pest than, than, than really a major pest like these two um, mealybug species. Uh, do not underestimate them. This is a critical part of this patho system. This is very much an interaction between a vine, a virus, and a vector. You can rogue all you like, but if you do not manage the vectors, the mealybugs, the scale insects properly, you will struggle to get on top of this disease. Whether that's through um, you know, the vector management, whether through uh, insecticides uh, or biological control or a combination of both, by doing that, you will greatly improve the management outcomes of leaf roll three in your vineyards. I'd like to uh, acknowledge um, a colleague of mine here, this, this, this man, uh, Dr. Alistair Hall. He uh, is a mathematician who worked with us here at uh, Plant and Food. Uh, Alistair has um, recently retired, but in the last few months, um, he and I and, and a couple of colleagues have actually produced this paper here on the management and financial implications of varying our responses to grapevine leaf roll disease. So at the moment, the protocol here in New Zealand is to simply rogue the vine that shows foliar symptoms of the disease. But we were curious to know whether there might be a, a better way, a, a more effective way of managing this disease. Um, and, and hence the, um, the work that went into publishing this paper here. So we looked at um, different management responses, the roguing of infected vines, taking out the infected vine plus the within row vines either side of it, what we call the first vines. Could that be another strategy that might actually help to manage this disease more effectively? And we also looked at that in the, on the basis of what we called inefficient roguing, uh, where the training of visual symptom identifiers uh, or the timing at which we look for those foliar symptoms in the vine might be poor, leading to only 50% of the symptomatic vines being removed. And the final option we looked at was one where a, 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 an odour decided to do nothing. So the no action option. And uh, what we found is that um, where we had low vector density, roguing outperformed all of the other tested options here and that relative to those other responses, roguing sustained the lowest annual virus incidence, the least need to plant replacement uh, vines, and it provided the lowest estimated average annual costs plus loss of income. Now, it's very much, re it's, this, this piece of work is re very much reiterating the current recommendations to New Zealand wine growers uh, around the country. Um, this is probably a piece of work that rather than being directed towards our grower community is probably best uh, directed towards um, the, the vineyard owners themselves and uh, their accountants. Um, there's a lot of uh, maths in here. There's a lot of economics. Uh, for a lot of people, um, our eyes would glaze over. But for the owners and I think for the, their accountants, um, there's some really important information in here. And I'm very grateful to New Zealand Wine Growers and uh, the government department, the MBIE, for funding this piece of work. Finally, and uh, just before I get start wrapping up, um, we've developed a, a decision support tree to help our growers manage the disease in whiteberry cultivars which of course are asymptomatic. 
So at the present time, the recommendation for them is that they need to be adopting the best practice insecticide recommendations uh, for the control of the vectors in those varieties. Um, there are plans um, that they can adopt in terms of getting an estimate of what the virus incidence within those blocks might be using um, serological laboratory testing techniques, and that gives them a 95% confidence interval around that. Um, and But in the terms of developing a roguing program, that is still very much a work in progress in those white berry cultivars. But where we can enact a roguing program is around the red berry cultivars. And how we might do that integrated response is really going to be quite dependent on what the virus incidence in those different blocks around the country might be. So for example, where virus incidence is low, at say less than 5%, we've set up a set of recommendations based on whether vector abundance is low or high. Um, ultimately, where vector abundance is low and virus incidence is high, the goal here in New Zealand, and, 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 and it's, it's, it's attainable, is potentially to be able to remove insecticides from the spray program in those particular vineyards or all those blocks that might make up those vineyards. That is something that's being uh, undertaken by some growers in New Zealand already. Where that becomes more problematic um, in avoiding those insecticides is around where you've got moderate to high virus incidence between six and 20 plus percent. And we've provided um, growers with um, um, you know, some direction as to where they might go with um, managing both the virus and the vectors in those circumstances. So some, some, some considerations for Canada here. Um, I think the CGCN uh, is going to be a significant confidence boost to, to those contemplating a rogue and replant program. I don't think I'm probably saying anything that isn't already being thought of there. It's clearly going to be screening for leaf roll three among other viruses. So for the growers, having the confidence to be able to pull out vine and know that you're planting something that has an, a, a warranty that it is free of a, um, another economically important pathogen is really, really important. In terms of uh, visual symptom identification, we believe that with training, it will also be effective in Canada, but there are likely to be some, some variables that might confound that. So for example, um, the timing of symptom expression influences the timing of monitoring. Too early and you risk too many uh, false positives. Um, different grapevine cultivars and different grape leaf roll um, variants in Canada may change uh, the appearance of those visual symptoms and the timing at which they occur. So those are a, a, a couple of ideas of things that you might need to be considering um, based on your unique circumstances up in Canada. And of course, some of your climatic factors, frosts, when they come along, they reduce, greatly reduce very quickly the ability for you to be able to reliably identify the visual symptoms of this disease. I can tell you from our experience here, Roguing works, it really does, but it only works when it's supported by low numbers of mealybug vectors in the vines. It is critical. How to understand vector abundance in the vines, um, sorry, <laughs> understanding vector abundance in the vines, influencing uh, leaf roll virus management, going to be really important for you to do that in Canada. I think you are like us, going to need to have low numbers of vectors to be able to get good management outcomes. For those of you who really don't want to consider insecticides, I, you know, listen, with the greatest of respect, I, I do think that is something that people are going to have to look at really closely, even if it's only for a few years to get on top of a vector problem. Um, consider the product range that you have there, the availability of different products, and the compatibility of those products with integrated pest management. So as Tom highlighted, those natural enemies, those biological control agents, if you're using broad spectrum chemistry, organophosphates and the like, they will take out not only the pest you're seeking to control, but all of your beneficial insects as well. And they will, those beneficial species will be much slower to respond, uh, to, to re-enter the vineyard after that chemistry has been applied. Um, and 
the final message I would want to make is for the chemical companies, the retailers, those people distributing those, those, those chemicals, and the science community themselves, simplify and synchronize your messages to your grower community. We've got to make sure that there's a single message going out, which is targeting the, the, um, the grower community and for which they, they understand and can apply it in their vineyards. Thank you everyone for, for, this, um, for this opportunity to the audience here today, um, to the CG, CGCN um, and its board of directors, uh, the KTT committee, I didn't know what that was, knowledge and technology transfer, um, New Zealand wine growers for the support they've given me over the years, and of course the, uh, the government department, Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, um, and of course to all of my colleagues, thank you. Thank you so much uh, to Vaughn and to the rest of our presenters. Uh, thank you Vaughn for reiterating the message that CGCN has been trying to tell the growers for, for years now, we need to replant with clean material. That's the only way we're going to combat this virus. Uh, so we'll get right into the question and answer session. I will go into our chat and then I'll go into our actual Q and A. So <coughs> we have a few questions here. Uh, we would like the panelists to weigh on best practices to adopt in organic vineyards to mitigate reduction of virus vectors that may be present outside of dormant oil sprays and roguing. Tom, do you want to kick off? Uh, I'll take a, a, I'll start and you'll have to flesh it out more Vaughn because uh, you've had longer experience with it. As I mentioned, we are really lacking uh, controls, uh, good effective insecticides, particularly on the uh, organic side. Uh, it's a very small market. Uh, we, we approach companies about getting things registered and it's very, very difficult, but we're working on it. We started much later than, than the, the, you did. You've been at it for quite a long time. Uh, in organic vineyards, there, the only spray options we really have, and, and I'm thinking now, I don't think they're actually registered for control of mealybug or scale. The only insecticides we have that are widely used are things like the, uh, the natural pyrethrum based materials. Uh, so that's very limited. You would have to target the crawler stage. And we do have problems with uh, not only the cost, but it's a broad spectrum. It's quite disruptive of the beneficials as well. So I'd, re I'd really suggest our current state of affairs in Canada right now, organic, really uh, the oil is critical, <laughs> not only the dormant, but growers are using these highly purified oils, horticultural oils that you can apply in the summer. And uh, growers are using those uh, with uh, quite good uh, effectiveness. So over to you, Vaughn, your, your take on more experience in Australia, in down south, New Zealand. New Zealand, not Australia. <laughs> New Zealand. <laughs> um, Tom and, and to the audience here, um, biological control, I, I think, is, is probably a bit of an unsung hero. hero. Uh, it does uh, much more than what we might appreciate and can be disrupted uh, very quickly, um, depending on different practices that we might adopt in our vineyard. Uh, Tom is right um, in the sense that there are not a lot of um, kind of... Um, insecticide uh, products that can be applied. We have just had registered in New Zealand, uh, and this is the first season where it's actually happened, uh, a product that we're calling Grandivo, or not we, the, the company, uh, I believe it's produced by New Farm. I might be wrong there. I don't know much about it, but it is registered for use in organic vineyards here in New Zealand. It has got the tick of approval of uh, BioGrow, uh, which is one of our um, organic um, organizations down here. Uh, I can't tell you anything about it other than, um, you know, it has registration, uh, the mode of action for it, how it kills the mealybugs, we don't know. 
uh, or they don't know. Um, so that is one option on the horizon here. I've not heard any feedback from the grower community as to um, how they've found using it um, in terms of expense. I, I, I know nothing about it. Yeah. If I can just uh, add to the, uh, I, I talked very briefly, showed some nice pictures of the parasitoids. Uh, that Andrea has been working on. Uh, it's, we're quite new into this, but we have seen a very, very high rate of parasitism. If you combine that with uh, predation, for one single stage of scale development, uh, you can get over 90% of the these wintered uh, female scales. And when we talk about the crawler stage, you have to remember it's the wintered females producing all these egg masses and producing. So the more parasitism you can get, uh, the more you're reducing the incidence of all these crawlers that are spreading it around. But uh, we see in organic vineyards in Canada, uh, quite a low incidence typically of mealybug and scale. It's only when you disrupt things. So if you just complement the uh, predators and parasitoids with oil sprays and, and gentler sort of approaches, that's, that's uh, probably your best bet. All right, thank you. Uh, I'll move on to uh, some questions for Jose, because I know Jose has to log off uh, at a, the strict one and a half hour time. So what was the weather like uh, for the 2013 to 2016? Uh, and would that have affected expression of differences? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I, w I will have to go specifically to each, you know, data set of the weather. Uh, but for example, we observe in terms of the effects on the leaf roll on, on the plant health and food quality, 2004, the, the, the bricks were consistent. You know, the bricks were basically every single year we saw a reduction on bricks. The other parameters were weather dependent, but we didn't really correlate the other parameters with the weather. In terms of the wine producing, uh, the, the, the most significant effects we saw in 2014, which I would say it was probably a, a standard year for us in BC. In 2015, as I mentioned in the presentation, it was the, the one of the hottest year in record in, in, in BC where where grapes were, were harvested, you know, uh, some, some cultivars with 27, 28 bricks, you know, so it was, it was uh, a nightmare for winemakers to, to, you know, to reduce this, this uh, alcohol volume. So in that sense, um, whether that, you know, it, it had a, a, an impact on, on the effects probably, but we haven't looked really into details, but what we are seeing in the, in the wine produ producing aspect is, is, is really significantly on, on on the year on weather dependent, which is correlated to maturity. That's what we basically have seen, you know, the year that we are not able to get that maturity or we are delaying in that maturity, that's where we are observing, you know, the, 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 the higher effects on, 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 on the wines mostly. All right, thank you, Jose. And I know that you have to log off soon. So I would just wanna thank you in advance for uh, presenting here with CGCN today. And whenever you have to log off, please go ahead. Uh, but we, yeah, will for that, yeah. we will continue with the Q&A session for a bit. Uh, okay, so what is a full spray program versus leaf roll vectors in New Zealand? Did you say that again? Sorry, you just cut out uh, there. Oh, sorry. What is a full spray program versus grapevine leaf roll virus vectors in New Zealand? The, the, the full spray program, so we have a... Um, a pre-flowering um, program which requires two applications of an active ingredient called buprofazin. Uh, buprofazin is an insect growth regulator which targets the um, the the the, 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 um, the juvenile um, life stages of the mealybugs uh, without disrupting the the natural enemy populations. Um, the recommendation, the label recommendation is for two applications, not one, as, as some growers tend to do. Uh, it has to be done pre-flowering because of the issues around residues. Uh, about two or three years ago, uh, there was a label change for Movento. Uh, Spirotetramat is the active ingredient for that. Um, that is, uh, it's a Bayer product, and they... Uh, 
um, we're allowed to apply that 10 days post flowering now, but it has to be, uh, it's got a PHI uh, pre-harvest interval of 90 days. Um, and that is about it for, for us. There's this new, uh, pro, this new uh, organic pro, um, product I talked about, Grandivo, for which I don't know very much. Um, the organophosphates are gone from our program. They are now finished. They are not allowed to be applied. And most of our grower community are no longer uh, or do not apply um, Oh dear, um, imidacloprid, um, which is uh, a neonicotinoid, um, because of the um, and if they if it is used, it's used as a soil drench for vines that are being uh, removed through the roguing process to kill subterranean populations of the Citrophilus mealybug, which can live on the roots of grape vines. Um, but really, we don't have an awful lot of options. Um, that is the kind of the extent of the insecticide program here in New Zealand now for mealybug. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will take, I think we'll take maybe three or four more questions if our the rest of our presenters here today don't mind going a little bit over time. Well, that's fine. It's okay with me. Okay. Is there just, a just, just one thing, Darian, sorry. I just was yeah. uh, checking in the, uh, the website. It looks like Grandivo, it may be available to Canada soon. I think it's in the pipeline. So I just wanted to mention that. Uh, Is it New Farm Jose or was I wrong there? Uh, it it's, it's says it's, it's Marron, Marron here, uh, organic. Okay. In, yeah, so it might be another distributor in, in New Zealand. Okay. But, uh, it's from Marron Bio Innovation. Right. Okay, that, 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 sorry. Thank you so much. Uh, is there a comprehensive resource available to help growers improve their ability to identify infected vines by visual symptoms? Um, I, I can start with that and maybe pass it to Tom. Uh, so there are, there are different, you know, um, resources online, you know, uh, that uh, they have descriptions on symptomatology some of the major universities in the state, like Washington State, University of California, they have some of these resources available. Um, here in Canada, currently, Tom, Laurie, and myself are working to update the um, uh, production guide for, for BC growers, where we are actually hoping to, to include some of these uh, parts. Uh, I believe Cavi, Brock University, have also some resources where they can uh, but I think, I think uh, yeah, this question is important. I think we should here in Canada probably work as Von Bell, you know, uh, mentioned to, to develop a comprehensive, you know, include as, as many possible, you know, options and differences in, in, in different cultivars and different also times of the year. So this is, this is what is in the pipeline right now, but I, I don't believe there is a really a, a full comprehensive uh, uh, identification guide. I, I will pass it to Tom. No, uh, we'll be working on that. Hopefully, now that the um, the BC production guide is going online, we can add photos to that. So that'll be good. But, uh, you know, once we update the chapter on the grapevine viruses, that'll be available. Uh, you know, and anyone across Canada can probably access those. So that'll be a big benefit to growers and, and uh, others. Uh, I know Sud has been working on some things uh, for Ontario. Uh, Wendy has as well. So uh, it's coming along. Uh, again, I'll mention that we're relatively new at this game. And so we had to first of all find out what we had. It's a little more challenging here in that uh, we have red blotch virus and early onset symptoms of leaf roll in the fall uh, can be confused easily with red blotch symptoms uh, before you get a lot of severe curling or anything. Uh, and then Jose knows this very well, not only the magnesium deficiencies, but sometimes growers, you'll have ESCA or something else that can also look a little bit like, you know, early symptoms, especially on some of the basal leaves 
young vines and it's you know what is that uh so it's it's a little more challenging and but it's definitely something that'd be worthwhile and we're working on it we've got a pretty good collection of photos now darian workshops 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 get out with the growers in the vineyards and you know show them in the vines it's um we do it all the time it's really, really worthwhile. I mean, photos are great, and we, we've got a, a website with, um, with photos on them, but I think having those workshops uh, with the growers on the ground, uh, with someone who knows what they're doing, is, is really good. And, you know, differentiating between cane girdling and magnesium deficiency, phosphorus deficiency, um, and leaf roll virus, of course, is, is really important. I know that everyone's probably been itching to get out of the house, out of these weather <laughs> oh, stuff like that. Sorry. So yeah. when when it is safe to do things yeah, like that I'm again, sorry. we definitely yeah. want to implement that. We just know it's just not available to us at this time. Yeah, no, but my we, mistake. I'm sorry. But that is a, a very valid, great suggestion, and we will be looking into doing that while, when we can. Uh, so we'll move on to another question here. Uh, I believe this was during Tom's presentation. Is there a minimum temperature for applying dormant oil and what volume per hectare? The, the, um, there isn't really a, a minimal, well, there is. It's more effective. What we recommend is uh, a later dormant uh, oil. And these new oils are quite good if you're using something like uh, Pure Spray Green, uh, something that they're highly refined. You're not getting the burning that you used to in the older oils that had a lot of sulfur content. So if you're using these highly purified oils, you can go quite late. I know some growers that uh, wait until you even get the start of uh, some blood, uh, bud swelling. And uh, so you want to go a bit, little bit later uh, when the temperature is a little bit warmer, it is a little more effective, but I don't want you to think that you, you can only put it on once it's uh, warmed up. If you get, uh, you don't want to get caught with the buds breaking or anything. Although it's so safe, these, uh, these clean, ultra clean oils are very safe. The, uh, if you're using the, the older type oils with the sulfur content, you don't want to wait till the buds are swelling. They really, you need full dormancy before you use those. So yes, there is a, depending on which oil you're using. Uh, as far as how you want to do this, uh, the recapture sprayer, these ones that put out a misty type of spray, that's not what you want. You want enough, a high volume, minimal volume. Um, you, you want to go, it depends on your equipment, how you're delivering it. You want to target as much as you can the cordon and the trunk and get a high volume, probably at least, uh, Vaughn probably knows more about this, uh, probably at least a, a thousand liters a, a hectare if you can, um, and, and possibly up from that. So uh, it's a little bit tedious that way. You really have to, if you have lots of bark, Think about that oil <laughs> solution, getting down in, coating the vine. You need a high volume or it's not yeah. going to work very well. Coverage is king. Yeah. And, you, and the best way to do it is, is get out and do a trial run and see how you're doing. Uh, spray some on there, rip the bark off and see if you got it down in. Uh, you know, sometimes you just go by your eyes that you see that uh, you've, you've, you're getting the coverage, you're, you're kind of drenching that, uh, that uh, the trunk and the, the cordon and you're getting it in there. If you have vines that are younger without a lot of bark, you don't need as high of a volume, you're probably going to get good coverage there. Okay. Um... Uh, as everyone can see, I don't know if everyone's seen, but Jose had to leave the webinar. He has put his, uh, his email in the chat if anyone has questions specifically for him, but we will continue with a couple more questions. Uh, is there any technology being worked on in terms of infrared or other handheld rapid testing methods to quickly ID virus infected vines? Do you have anything going on in New Zealand, Vaughn? Uh, yes, we do. Um, I, I, I'm not involved in it, so I can't um, say much about it, I'm afraid. Um, 
there is there is some work going on around the use of um, different Im imaging and artificial intelligence. Um, it's way beyond my pay grade. Um, I, I'm not sure how. Well, it, it'll it'll come along. Uh, when I don't know. Um, they of course have to train this technology to be able to distinguish between magnesium and phosphorus and cane girdling and, and whatever else uh, might be happening. So, um, yep, I've got a colleague who's actually, I'm, I'm about to catch up with her in about 40 minutes time and um, we're going to have a coffee and uh, that's exactly what she's working on uh, as we speak. Yeah, uh, it's too bad Jose left. He was a little more involved in uh, the project than I was. Uh, and it was led by Pat Bowen and Carl Bogdanoff. Uh, we were we'd linked with a very good researcher, now retired, but that uh, who was at the University of Victoria, and using uh, drones, they used uh, you know the spectral, these super uh, complicated programs to try to sort out you know taking. It's it's complicated. They were able to do it to some extent, but it wasn't foolproof and there's still more work to be done on it. But they were able to get a uh, pretty good uh, identification uh, of uh, leaf roll infected binds in their their test site. So it's coming along, but it's a uh, very these multispectral different uh, types of wavelengths and cameras. It, it involved more than one type of camera, so it's it's pretty complicated. We're not we're not to the stage yet where you can just buy one off the shelf at Grower Supply and go out and uh, and uh, determine that you've got to, and and as you mentioned, that the trickiest part is going to be separating out these symptoms that look very similar. Okay, uh, I think we'll stop at at uh, two forty five Eastern time. So I'll take two more questions and then I'll wrap everything up. Uh, we have a participant here who is new to Canadian viticulture. They say they've had good results uh, with controlling mealy bugs with Mavento, also controlling Argentine ants, who attracted to the honeydew in turn protected the mealy bugs from natural predators. Yep. So they're asking, are ants part of the cycle in Canada or more specifically BC? Uh, so, yes, uh, ants play a role, as uh, the uh, grower mealybug They do protect the, the mealy bug and scale. They collect the honeydew, and in exchange, they're very defensive. If you go up and you touch a leaf, or a, uh, they'll, they'll run around, get all agitated, and try to figure out what enemy is coming. So where we see the greatest problem with mealybugs in particular is on the dry sandy soils of uh, the South Okanagan. So there's a clear link there where we see the biggest populations of mealybug. It's tied to that, those sort of locations, also where we have the highest populations and numbers of species of ants. And uh, it's something that we should look into uh, California uses ant control as one of their options for mealybug and scale control. Uh, we're seeing more. We have new species of ants showing up all the time. Uh, there's a researcher out of Kamloops that's been doing some work on that. So uh, there could also be some need to uh, control ants and some. So Mavento, yes. So you're not directly controlling the ants. You're controlling the mealybug and scale and that reduces the uh, population of ants. The ants uh, might be controlled somewhat with the Mavento. They would be picking up some of the uh, insecticide through the honeydew that they're, that they're ingesting. But I don't know how much is direct effect on the ants and how much is secondary through a, a, a reduction in their, their favored uh, source of food. That honeydew is very attractive. It's one of the things you should do if you're monitoring for mealybug and scale, you really should be monitoring throughout the season, including during pruning. We see lots of the overwintering scale and mealybug. That'll give you an indication. The crawlers, as I mentioned, the tape, uh, you can use it, but it's kind of, you need a microscope. It's hard to tell them apart. And the timing isn't that precise as I showed with the different curves 
uh, can vary between and even within vineyards, it seems. Uh, and then you can also be watching the best way to find the nymphs on the leaves, look for the ants running up and down the, the trunk and, and, uh, and uh, milking uh, the, the honeydew from the uh, mealybug and scale. So uh, yes, it's uh, good that you've noticed that they play a key role. Okay, thank you. Uh, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to share my screen and we're going to end the session for today. If anyone has any other questions that either weren't addressed in the session or they would like to address afterwards, please send me an email and then I can get you in contact with any of the presenters that were here today. So I'll just share my screen to end us out here. So thank you again to our three presenters today, to Jose, who has left the session, but his email is in the chat, same with Vaughn's. Uh, thank you, Tom, and thank you, Vaughn, for your time. I know uh, it's a wee morning hours there in New Zealand, so thank you so much. Uh, we will just show this so that we can make sure that we can uh, post this to CGCN's website mm -hmm. where uh, you will be able to see the webinar recording and you can send it to anyone who wasn't able to sit in our session today. And lastly, join us again on Thursday, May 27th. This week we've sent this, set this date tentatively uh, for our third webinar installment. We will be discussing trunk diseases. Time is yet to be determined and the link to register for the next uh, webinar will open in early May. To ensure you are the first notified of this, subscribe to our newsletter by visiting CGCN's website under our contact page. To stay updated with webinar dates and details, follow us on social media. Our handles are at the bottom of the screen here, or check our website under the events section regularly. This webinar has been recorded and will be posted to our website if you ever want to revisit it or send it to someone who is unable to attend. So thank you so much, everyone, for uh, joining CGCN in our relief roll virus webinar uh, today. And we hope to see you again in May. Thank you so much. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.